Hello everybody, my name is Zolani Maola. I am the one who sings. And that song that I opened our symposium with is a song called Teta Mama. In Isikosa, that means speak, mother. And I've come to see it as a call to hear each other's stories and to tell each other our stories with the goal of connecting with each other. What a wonderful way to open our symposium on race, space, and the environment. I am here in Cape Town, South Africa, and many of you are around South Africa, and some of you will be further up north, all over the States, and I'd like to welcome you to our symposium. We'll be discussing the intersectionality of race, of the spaces that we live in, of the effects of um, the destruction of our natural environment and its effects on marginalized populations, but also a discussion on how, at the end, we're all in this together. Or are we? <laughs> when I was growing up in 1980s and 1990s apartheid South Africa, I remember so clearly so many conversations around the idea of Ubuntu, the idea of, um, of human connection, the idea that there's no separation between us. And it was such, a, such an incredibly moving idea in a country that is so divided by so many layers of history. And I think that with the dawn of the pandemic, I think that we are being challenged in many, many ways. But I think that there are also opportunities arising for us to peel away those layers that have been separations between us. And I think that this discussion is such an important one that we are about to have. I must state here, actually, that I'm sorry that I can't be there live with you because I'm at this moment recovering from a, an operation on my vocals. But it's so important for us to come together across the world and to see solutions, to find solutions that promote our connectedness beyond all of the previous barriers of the old world. So that is what we are doing here at the Symposium of Race Space and the Environment. And I would like to invite you all to share openly from all of areas of expertise. Um, Again, I'm sorry that I could not be with you live, but I'm completely there with you in spirit. So, from Cape Town, South Africa, enjoy the rest of the symposium. Back. I'd like to discuss, you know, how the elements for our climate have changed over time and what effect it has had on our ability to, you know, feed ourselves. Like, what is it really, how does it manifest in our lives and what do we see the future looking like? Uh, Jamie, with your deep understanding and background and trying to present this information of how the climate has changed and, and what we're looking for in our future, um, you know, what does the data say about a habitable planet? You know, give us a little history about the past, kind of where we're at now, what we're looking at for the future. And, you know, secondarily, I'm really curious because I, you know, we've had this data uh, around for a while, we've known for decades, you know, but has it really affected folks? Like, what are we doing with it? Sure. No. No. Thanks, Ken. I mean, that's a that's a big a big question. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to answer it relatively succinctly. Um, sure. so just a little bit about my background. So I've been working over the past uh, ten to fifteen years, um, really attempting to use these long term climate trends uh, in communications. Um, so my background, um, I've got a PhD in natural resources and information sciences from Cornell University, which is just down the street from from many of you guys. Um, we're really trying to focus on, on understanding, you know, what, what drives people to action, what drives people to, to, to make change. Um, and so 
in doing that work, um, I've worked with a number of different organizations, um, you know, including NASA, uh, you know, some of the bigger sort of science organizations and NASA, NOAA, uh, worked for the White House under Obama, um, you know, the World Bank, the UN, the IPCC, um, <clears throat> really trying to help understand, you know, what drives, what drives action and how can we um, provide information and data to people to, to, to change behaviors and, and, and both at the large scale policy level, but also at the individual level. Um, so, so there's two, two questions there, Ken, that I think are, are, are different questions and, and, and can be answered differently. Um, you know, one is, is what, what does the data tell us? Um, that's, that's an important question. Um, and, and secondly, you know, how does the, how, or if the, how does the data compel people to act? Or, or does it compel people to act? So, so I'll answer those two, two questions separately. So in, in terms of what the data tells us, um, you know, not to min, mince words, that we're, we're in a lot of trouble, right? Um, the, the, the historical data is clear. Uh, climate change is happening. It's, it's been happening. Um, this is something we've known for a very long time. Um, and in that historical record, we are seeing trends um, in every community, in every part of the world, um, you know, uh, in, in, in terms of changing climate and, and how that, how that, what that means is even though we have a global change, right. So we can actually track globally, which is a pretty incredible human invention, right. That we, 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 we have a system now that's capable of tracking temperatures, which I think we, we, we sometimes just ignore that, that how incredible that actually is. Um, but we can see in, 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 in the historical data, there, there is a trend towards warming, right. But specifically how that gets, um, experienced at the local level is is different everywhere right even though we have this trend it could be more storms you know more precipitation events more heavy more more heavy rains more hurricanes um you know more drought less drought more drought and less drought in the exact same location right so so really what we're seeing is is a is a chaotic system where where once you know our as human beings we have built a, a social and, um, and 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 economic structures around this idea that the future is going to look like the past, right? So all our hospitals, all our roads, all our entire economic system is really based on that foundational, uh, just given, right? That the, 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 fu the future is going to look like the past. And the one thing that we do know about the future is that it's not going to look like the past. The present doesn't look like the past and the future is going to look uh, increasingly more chaotic. Um, so so that, that, that's sort of the takeaway around, around that message. Um, you know, when we start looking at future data, we start, you know, in the climate world, we, we're looking at these 30 year, you know, 10, 20, 30 year time periods, right? So we're not mistaking the weather for the climate. The climate is really a long term trend. Um, so when we look into the future, we have these data sets called scenarios, which um, provide us with, you know, what if scenarios. So, so what if the world produce this much greenhouse gas emissions? What if the world reduced our greenhouse gas emissions? What would that do to, 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 the, to the temperature and, 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 and climate change in general and the earth systems? So, you know, one of those scenarios, which is the scenario we're currently on, is, is looking at a, at a world that's completely uninhabitable by 2100, full stop. Um, in, 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 you know, it, not to say humans won't survive, there will be some humans that survive in different pockets and, and how that turns out, we don't know. But, you know, in, in terms of, you know, the US um, and Syracuse specifically, you know, we're looking at average summertime temperatures that are pretty similar to what we see in Death Valley, right? So, so and we all understand what the, what the ecosystem looks like in Death Valley, for those of you who don't, it's, it's basically a giant desert, um, you know? So, so, so that's the kind of scenario that we're looking at um, in, in Syracuse, in, in South Africa, um, yeah, you're, you're probably moving from a Mediterranean climate to, to one of, of almost complete desert, desertification. So, so this, this is the, the unfortunately, the, the direction that um, we're going in. I know there's a lot of action right now, which, which I'm really, um, really glad to see. I mean, countries are, are uh, I, you know, uh, with the election in the US anyways, I think there's a lot of momentum now to, to make that change. But that's really what we're up against. So, so when we're talking existential crisis, um, this is probably the biggest existential crisis that, that, that we could face. Um, the good news is that, that you know, there is some time. Um, we're, we're not going to get away from, from not dealing with climate change. It's, it's happening now. Um, even under the most optimistic scenarios, we're still going to see at least a 1.5 to 2 degree change 
um, and that's globally. So places in the north and places in the south, South Africa being one of those, um, that they're going to see a disproportionate amount of change compared to equatorial countries. So, 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 and that's going to happen regardless of what policy actions we take. So, so, you know, I'm hopeful that there will be policy actions that we can withstand as a global community, but it's going to, it's going to stretch every single, <laughs> every single uh, resource and every single institution that we have. Um, so Ken, I, I don't know, I'm happy to stop there. I, I can go no. into you're doing great. The great might be the wrong word. It's sh sh shocking. You know, I think when I first really started being aware of what was transforming our planet and where we were heading, it really, um, it, it, it shook me like profoundly. And I think I'm concerned that most people don't understand the seriousness of it. And there's that balance, right? Like you said, it's so serious finding that hope uh, as part of the conversation, you know, I, I, I found you and your wonderful work at Habitat 7 uh, while doing a UI UX class here at Syracuse. And we're, you know, looking at the work that you had been doing for the Obama White House and the Canadian government and others to, uh, you know, illustrate what it really was to try to manifest this reality and, and let people know, you know, do you, what do you see as the next step in communication when it comes to this? How do you see this? What have we learned from trying to communicate this? And like, how can we shift that with that understanding to try and, and really affect change? Sure. No, no, I, I appreciate the question. I mean, that, that, that's, that's a big question. And, and honestly, a question I don't necessarily have an answer for. Um, you know, I have, I have hunches. <laughs> but so, so I'll, I'll go on hunches. So, so please don't take this as yeah, a, please. anywhere close to accurate. Um, but, you know, my, my hunch, and, and this is something that I've been working through over the past, you know, five to six years, um, you know, I, I got pretty disenfranchised with the work that we were doing, to be, to be mm -hmm. fully honest. You know, we, we, we put so much effort into, into doing these, these projections and doing maps and doing graphs and, and trying to show people, hey, you know, this is the potential future we're down, right? That this, is, this, is, this is the pathway that we're on, and this is what this looks like. Um, you know, and for the most part, when, when people are faced with that type of existential crisis, um, that's distant, right? It's not happening today. It's like, well, you know, in 2050, 2060, 2080, you know, these numbers are pretty abstract. So most people, and, and this is where I don't know if this is a human trait or a cultural trait. Um, it's, it, you know, at this point, I'm not sure it really matters. Um, but for the most part, we put that off. Okay, well, we'll deal with that later, right? Um, and, and so really what, what I've been trying to do and, and, and sort of my hunch is that if the data is more immediate, right? If the data is more actionable today, um, that we will see action being taken. Um, and so the, you know, the, the, the COVID challenge, I think as, as horrible as it is, it, in some ways has encouraged me um, to, to, to see just how quickly we as human beings can take action and the scales at which we can take action. And, and, and sure there's flaws and sure, you know, we haven't done it perfectly and, and, you know, there's issues with that, but we have done things that, you know, within a year, that a year ago were completely unthinkable, right? We're shutting down borders, we're shutting down economies, we're, we're changing economies um, on a dime and, and we're, we're muddling our way through it as, as, as a species. Um, but we are taking action and, and major actions that we just, you know, I mean, two years ago, if someone said, hey, we're going to close the border between Canada and, and the US, I would have laughed. Then, no way. That's never going to happen. Right. It happened on yeah. a gone. So, 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 so in my mind, that, that's actually quite encouraging. And, and to see that, you know, although there have been, you know, major struggles, it hasn't been the doomsday scenario that everybody predicted. Um, so, you know, my work, especially now, and, and, and where I think there is hope in, in some perverse kind of way is that, you know, climate change is happening now, and we have to make decisions on it now. The way we experience like climate change as human beings in, you know, the time, uh, you know, the timelines that we understand, right, it's immediate. So, so, so it, 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 it kind of comes down to the weather, right? So, so weather is happening. We experience climate change through, through weather impacts, right? Um, those have become uh, more frequent and more severe. So, so as those become more impactful, I, I feel like there has been a real shift in you know, people thinking 20 years ago, oh, we're gonna lose polar bears and ice caps. 
and that's sad. I'll donate ten dollars, but you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, right. like I'll be bummed about it if there's no yeah. polar bears. But you know, I, I can live without them. You know, um, and, and and same without ice caps too. Hey, this is hitting the heart of our economic systems, our social mm -hmm. systems. This is this is. Causing I think chaos. we've seen that in our students now coming from California, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's absolutely. starting to be relevant to people at Newhouse who are breathing in the smoke of the fires in the summer and have had to evacuate. And I think nothing's, you know, uh, nothing's more real and uh, than our ability to produce food. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if we can't eat, we're in bad shape. And Ernest, you know, this is an area that that you specialize in. So, you know, my question to you about food and food production. You know, how have things changed in sub-Saharan Africa? And we're thinking about sustainability in the future. What do you see? Well, um, Ken, thank you very much. I think, you know, this is a very important question and um, I'm glad you did ask. And so like Jamie said, um, the climate is changing and we can all agree to that, right? I mean, some people will disagree, but it's changing around the world. Um, and the truth is, you know, climate change is hitting Africa the hardest. Um, farmers are suffering complex, localized impacts of climate change and are disproportionately, you know, affected by extreme climate and weather events. And so this is, you know, particularly true because the continent highly depends on agriculture. And so what kind of agriculture do we practice in Sub-Saharan Africa? And we're talking about you know, small scale subsistence farming, right? Where farmers produce for themselves and then they sell the rest, you know, for profit. And so with, you know, the majority of smallholders and subsistence farmers in the dry lands, there is a particular concern, you know, over temperature induced declines in crop yields, right? And the increasing frequency and severity of drought you know, torrential rains, heat waves are having very devastating, you know, consequences on farmers across, you know, the continent. And so, you know, we begin to see more increased likelihood of crop failures. And like you said, we all need to eat, right? I mean, we need food to survive. And so, you know, what that means is a dramatic reduced in harvest will obviously leave, you know, people hungry. And that's, that's not good. And so that's a very you know, critical issue. Um, and then there's also increased in pests and diseases, right? And we can even think about mortality of livestock. And recently, you know, you know, farmers experienced um, army worms and people you know, began to ask for reasons. You know, some scientists are saying they don't actually know you know, the, the cause, but the possible, the possibilities because of what climate change. And so again, forced, you know, source of livelihoods at a very reduced price, obviously it's also not good for what farmers. Then there's also, you know, increased insecurity because obviously we've been depending on, you know, foreign aid. And what that means is we're always going to depend on foreign aid. And I think, you know, this is not a good news for Africa, even though, you know, we can give up, like you said, we need hope, you know, in these tough times. And so there's that downward spiral, right? You know, lack of food would obviously have impact on what, the human security. And so then that will lead into some other consequences like the health of farmers, you know, who depend on, you know, agriculture on subsistence farming to support their families. And so besides the impact on you know, human health, there are also other social impacts. You begin to see people crossing borders, you know, into Europe, you know, traveling through the sea or walking, you know, to seek for greener pastures. And so again, you know, when we look at climate change, it's not just about food. It has, you know, it, it kind of cuts across, you know, the borders and it has very devastating impact for, you know, the people of Sub-Saharan Africa. And one of the key issues that you know, we tend to leave out of the conversation is the fact that, you know, reduced agriculture production would also mean that, also means that we need more land. 
but then climate change is having very devastating impact on what desertification is causing people to now you know cut down forest and begin to increase forest production obviously that's something we also need to think about so you know issues about civil unrest competition for land competition for water these are some of the things that you know we have to begin to critically address thank you Ernest. i think that's there's no bigger thing than, than being hungry and being thirsty. You know, if we're right. destroying our, our world, we're gonna be in bad shape. I've worked off and on in Liberia and West Africa for the past 12 years. And one of the phrases they use there is a hungry man is an angry man. Right, right. <laughs> and, and that is certainly true. And I, how to process this if we are destroying our natural environment uh, Neil Paulus uh, put a comment here. California, yes, the students from Oklahoma who are experiencing increasing earthquakes, likely from fracking. So the destroying of our natural environment, not only by releasing CO2 in the atmosphere, by pumping things back into the earth and destabilizing systems. Uh, it's really profound and uh, disturbing. And what we're trying to do right now is just kind of set the table and uh, for our conversation as we move forward. So thank you both for that. I know there's some comments and questions in the Q&A and we'll try and get to those as best we can. Panelists, you're certainly welcome and invited to answer some of those just through the Q&A chat. Thank you. All right, so Zolani posed the question, are we actually in this together? You know, that's certainly a, a real question and I think uh, poses a good discussion. Uh, there was a great quote going around around the beginning of the pandemic. You guys might be familiar with it. We're in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. None of us can afford an action and the failure to acknowledge this fact in and of itself is an action. It's a choice to ignore others in the storm. So, you know, so my question is, you know, it's important if we want to know where we're going, you know, how did we get here? And I'd like to pose that first question really to Farhana. Hi, Farhana. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Uh, I thank you, Ken. I really appreciate you uh, being flexible and spending time with us and trying to help us understand this really complicated and profoundly disturbing uh, set of uh, questions that we're trying to wrap our minds around. So, you know, what I'd ask you is, what's the role colonialism has played in the current climate crisis? All right, um, so thank you, Ken, for inviting me to join this webinar and um, hello and welcome to everyone who's joining in or um, listening in or watching later on. So the question you've posed is really important um, and it is a complex one. So what I'll try to do is kind of touch upon a few uh, points and very broad brush strokes um, to set the context. So colonialism, um, as we know it, uh, or as many of us know it, um, is largely structures the world that we cur uh, currently live in. So starting um, you know, 500 years ago with the European conquest of the Americas, then proceeding through um, Africa and Asia, what we've seen is um, colonial forms of exploitation, resource control, imperialism, uh, a global economic system, and so on that um, we've inherited. But again, this um, addresses one of the questions, who's the we? Yes, there is no we. There's a collective we in terms of perhaps a global, you know, a human population, but it is quite fractured. And colonialism set into motion certain kinds of global patterns. So you often hear terms like the global south or the majority world um, that signifies countries that were exploited and brutalized or colonized and you know, expropriated, uh, largely existing across Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And even though they're um, independent countries now, they're no longer um, European colonies, but we're, they're still part of a global system whereby both European and European settler colonial states, such as the US, Australia, Canada, largely dominate the rules of the game the global rules of the game that condition our conditions of possibility to exist, right? In terms of 
trade, negotiations, and, and so on. So these spaces of power are often euphemistically termed the global north. And yes, these terms are really broad and they're problematic. But what we're trying to understand is that these patterns that exist, they have a historical rationale behind them. And of course, there are heterogeneities contained therein. What we do know is that part of the colonial model that we've inherited and uh, contemporaneously live with set a, a largely racialized pattern of exploitation that continues from colonial times to today. So what we're witnessing is powerful, wealthy countries, but also global elites who are part of that, whether they're from the global north or the global south, benefit from and continue to benefit from um, exploiting the historically exploited communities and countries. So where you have this capitalism system or racial capitalism that arose and continues, um, ar ar that arose out of colonialism and it uh, dominates the global economic and trade systems. So this is one of the longstanding legacies of colonialism that really has bearing on a range of issues, whether it's agriculture, food production, water scarcity, and so on. One of the things that's um, been really talked about, um, and especially um, amongst uh, scholars who study these issues, is that colonial and imperial countries used in the past and continue to use a lot of the natural resources that help them advance technologically and in terms of material well being through, let's say, fossil fuel extraction, deforestation, raw uh, material, minerals, land and water grabs, and so on. And this has led to accumulation of wealth, but also increasing um, emission of greenhouse gases. So what this means is that even though the countries that are you know, post-independent or are often called post-colonial countries that have come into being na na independent nation states, largely post-World War II, they remain disproportionately marginalized through structures of exploitation that harm their citizens continually through global trade terms, financial structural adjustment programs, uh, labor devaluation and exploitation, natural resource extraction, and so on. Um, and that doesn't mean that there hasn't been material gains uh, or, you know, uh, well-being in these countries and economies, but there's that disproportionate historical burdening in terms of both power relations, but then also contribution to global greenhouse gases. And what we're seeing is increasingly those forms of accumulation and consumption, largely in the global north, has led to these greater emissions being accumulated over centuries that are trapped in the atmosphere, which leads to what we currently know as climate change or climate breakdown. And what is ironic is that the countries that have um, contributed the least to this problem are the ones where the impacts have historically been the worst felt. Again, countries across um, parts of Latin America, Africa, and Asia, because they've largely been in the tropical and subtropical zones. Now we're seeing greater climate shifts and breakdown globally, um, and, but historically issues around um, storms, floods, sea surges, sea level rise, uh, cyclones, hurricanes, heat stress, drought, um, water scarcity, and so on have been quite acutely felt in these um, spaces. And obviously this is continuing as, as more greenhouse gases such as um, carbon dioxide uh, continues to be emitted into the atmosphere. So one of the things we need to think about is like how these frontline countries and communities who have been historically impoverished um, and their economies are still trying to play like catch up, um, but yet they're experiencing uh, these climate breakdowns and shifts um, in interconnected and intersecting ways. So the increasing frequency and intensities of climate related hazards are impacting various communities um, in different economical, social, political ways. And these disproportionate climate impacts are really causing harm to more marginalized community members within those countries. Um, and we're seeing this occurring both in post-colonial context, but also in settler colonial context, let's say the US or in Africa where racially marginalized communities have been historically subjected to environmental racism, um, which has led to greater climate injustices in their communities. 
So I think what I'll conclude with is that the main point, um, and I know I've got, covered a lot of material in, in really broad ways. I encourage everyone to, to read up on this as best you can. There are a lot of resources online, but the main point is that we need to recognize these connections between colonialism, neocolonialism, and capitalism that continue to play out in interlocking ways. And that has an impact in various components of the environment. Um, land, water, timber, fisheries, minerals, um, agriculture, and so on. So the lived experiences um, of these processes of you know, colonialism, neocolonialism, as it plays out through global economic orders and trade systems, capitalism and you know, capitalistic models or you know, systems of economic development, development interventions across the global south, these have impact in the lived realities and these are largely racialized globally. And they continue to be even after hundreds of years. So even if we say these are, you know, we live in post-colonial times, the question is, did colonialism really go away? No, what scholars say is the continuities of coloniality. So the colonialities of power structures, um, you know, and, and uh, hierarchies, they continue. So while these are largely racialized, obviously they're also intersected by class, gender, ethnicity, and so on. And there are obviously contextual differences, but I wanted to lay out in these broad brushstrokes that about how we got here and why that matters. Like how we got here um, should help us understand the spatial, the temporal, and the scalar connections that continue to structure our world as we know it right now and continues to impact socioeconomic and socioecological realities of very marginalized communities uh, who do not often uh, get heard or heeded. And we therefore need to pay get greater attention to concerns of historical and contemporary factors that continue to maintain form various forms of climate injustices. As powerful. And it is, it's the complexities of unpacking this is part of the, the rub, isn't it? Like for me, you know, I'm uh, more of a pracademic than an academic. And when I really became aware of what we were up against, it also coincided with the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and the pandemic. And it made me pause, you know, to really consider what is colonialism, what's capitalism, what's its role in the power dynamics and in the destruction of our natural world. Um, and this discussion isn't gonna answer those things but I really hope it spurs people to be curious and to seek answers, not only for ourselves, our families, but you know the future generations that are gonna come after us. Um, Neil, uh, Paulus asked a question here. So do you reference the definition of wealth that comes from a colonial perspective that seems to be controlled by those who benefit from stolen land resources who continue to perpetuate the current exploitive economic practices. What would need to happen, if it is possible, to recreate a more equitable economic structure that supports sustainability? There's a small question. <laughs> That's a good one, though. You know, it's what do you think, Farhana? What do you think we need to do? Is there something that can be reshaped? You know? Oh, okay. Oh, so that question is for me. All right. I didn't realize yeah. that. Um, uh, good question, because these racialized communities are both Black and Indigenous communities, right, in, in the U.S. Um, so how can we, let me just look at the question again, so create more uh, equitable economic structures that support sustainability? Well, I think the first thing is not only have a seat at the table, but configure the table itself. I think the, the problem is that these patterns of dispossession um, not only silence and um, marginalize various types of communities, but set the terms, the people in power set the terms of the debate, uh, and those kinds of things need to shift if we're going to really think about, um, you know, well-being, both ecological and human well-being and the interconnections thereof. But then we also need to figure out that there are different cosmologies and worldviews. Um, you know, indigenous cosmologies don't necessarily sit with 
right? Eurocentric or capitalistic worldviews. And sometimes they seem um, incommensurable or irreconcilable. So I think we need to really have concerted conversations and how we shift the parameters of discussions so that we can think about, you know, what is wealth? What is well being? So when I was talking about wealth earlier, it was about those global accumulations of wealth that was about extraction of re uh, natural resources, but also human as resources, right? Through mm. transatlantic slavery, but then also through various forms of genocide and ecocide that occurred not only in the Americas, but across the world. And one last thing I'll say is that um, through my work around the world is that I've noticed that there's often hemispheric biases and how people narrate um, you know, solutions or even um, nativistic and nationalistic um, you know, ideologies at play. What is really rec needed is that global collaboration and recognizing mm -hmm. um, that we need to hear different types of voices and different um, you know, types of ideas rather than focusing only on what is happening locally, because what is happening locally is very much connected to what is happening locally elsewhere. And we need to find those patterns and structural and systemic mm -hmm. barriers to why mm -hmm. we see ongoing patterns of marginalization. Awesome. Yeah, that's exactly what this conversation is supposed to be about and finding partners and our partners in South Africa with trying to unpack these difficult things that on the face of it is it's so daunting. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly the concept of colonialism is uh, something that uh, South Africa has had uh, a, a horrific time with. Uh, Kalile, how are you? How are you doing over there? I'm good, and you? I'm good, nice to see you. Nice to uh, see you. So I have a question for you. How have you seen racism and colonialism show itself in Makanda? I guess I'll find a quicker way to get into it. I guess the town itself is it's a colonial town and how it's designed um, is divided according to race where the rest, the majority of the people have to walk down to town to work you see that picture every day, you know, even when they, in the afternoon, the same audience, the group of people going back to their community. So there's no productivity happening in their own community most of the time. They are at work building something else elsewhere. So that system of living still exists. And, and we inherited a broken society after 1994, which means the mindset and how we think that on its own is being broken. So even me conversating to the world, I have to navigate my thinking through English, meaning that the whole world is that I have been deprived by the whole entire world, which is at the end of the day, even when I conversate in Makanda as a young man, black man, I have to affirm myself in English to sound that I'm better enough. So there's a lot you will find, for example, in terms of language and how some other systems could be changed, which are foreign to the, the concept of people, how they live through language, you realize that um, you, 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 you're living in a space where you constantly being oppressed by the design of the system that you have to fit in to survive. So it for generations, that's been the system that is left for us, which I agree with what the speaker just spoken now, the systems are remaining to maintain the system. So Makande, the racism exists. The racism exists in all levels. So for me, um, to exist, I need to realize that from even my, 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 my existence is questionable. But I guess um, the reality is that uh, after 94, we, we were forced to um, relax. We're not being put in a place where we can ask serious questions like, um, we, the language that is being used to silence us, to not address real issues has been the one, unemployment, the same cycle of people have to go and ask for job, education. We're living in an, edu in an educational city that the majority, which is still unemployed. So it's a very much um, a confused environment, which we have to live with these 
um, what can I say, these dilemmas. So I guess for us in Makanda, we actually calling it Makanda now. It was called Grahamstown. Even that is a, a psychological transition that we are dealing with because what does that mean? To other people, it means now we have to represent ourselves differently. It means me, myself, I can be proud and say this is, I'm from Makanda, but for someone else, it means something is being erased. So meaning that we're dealing with these realities of how do we have a conversation as a society that is looking for a transition towards a unified a community that embraces Ubuntu. So, it is a very confused uh, position we're in, but I can say it does exist because we cannot have real conversation like these ones without being labeled. So you okay. always have to uh, counter your words so that you don't speak as if you are strong enough and believing what you are believing in. So you must allow a gap in between for other people to have a say, although they don't need to have a say because you want to have a conducive environment. So that's why I think for me, it's the difficult thing to live in the city, but I'm not planning to leave anywhere because I think this is a home. Um, so I guess for me, my parents have lived a different life. And I think for me, the packages of the past have a way of trying to follow me and I've been trying to navigate between these two realities and seeing how these works. And then you see those things um, uh, taking shape every day. You know, colonialism is taking a different shape every day because it's a project that will never six to one to die. And you had told me a story about your grandfather's land and yeah. access to water. What, yeah, I uh, guess, okay, sorry. Yeah, no, please. No, like uh, the story was most, after 94, there were lands that were given to people, you know, and my grand grandfather, uh, he just passed away weeks ago. He was 107. Mm -hmm. So basically um, the land he's in, um, uh, they, they don't, there's a river that runs down so, but they don't have access to the water. So, but uh, before they got the land, they had a title, they had um, an agreement to have a pump, pumping the water. But the, the person who's renting the farm next door, which is a white owner, which sends the very same um, young black man, pays the money to actually destroy the pump so that my grandfather with his cows and the rest of other community who live there cannot access water, which is the end of the day. It's like, these are the daily problems is that you cannot have progress because this man who happens to be white doesn't approve of these people sharing the same water, which is a fundamental thing to be a farmer, to have access to water. But for him, an old man, 107, has to deal with such thing, racism to someone who is much younger, who will tell him in his face that he doesn't belong there. And my grandfather will tell him how he got there. And this one is just renting the farm. He's not even from there. You know, so in a way you realize these are the realities that we have to face as young men, which we feel that this is not supposed to be happening. Just water alone for livestock, for your crops, even for yourself to drink. You know, you, you cannot access that water, which also at the end of the day is like um, this basic thing that all of us should consume, you know, but at the end of the day, someone else feels that they have a right to decide. And those people have a system that supports them, even though like uh, <laughs> you can go and report it, but you, they will tell you that there's no proof while well, you have proof. So in a way that is someone who has passed away leaving us with that burden to actually deal with this man. And there's no way he's gonna change because it costs money to replace a solar panel, which uh, they had to collect and sell their cow to put it together. And now it's stolen and broken. And that's gonna cost them thousands. So they, the animals are dying, the crops cannot grow. So in the reality of this uh, place we're living in, you realize how do you have peace in such a place? So. 
Uh, it's a dry place, but there is water from the ground that can help the community to survive, but still other people are obstructing it. Hmm. And I know you said there was a, a well that people come to for the whole community. And in fact, Janice, I think you brought this up uh, originally. Yeah. And I think uh, you had mentioned that rich and poor people come to this well uh, yeah. this spring yeah. to, to get water out. I think that's an amazing, that's a little bit of hope in a dark story, you know, a central place where people can come together and do come together. It's and, true. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it's a term, as an artist, you know, you know, you use your art and the work you do at the Black Power Station uh, to try and unpack this and wrestle with it and, and uh, provide answers um, and uh, a bit of art therapy, no doubt, uh, in the process. Um, and I know Jaleel also does the same thing in here in Syracuse. Mm -hmm. Jaleel, I've loved your work for so long. Mm -hmm. um, you do some this magnificent uh, art and um, actually went to uh, undergraduate here at Casanova College where I live out in Casanova, New York, just outside of Syracuse. So you have a lot of fans out here too. <laughs> Jaleel, so with art, you know, it's such a powerful force to make sense of the senseless. You know, what do you see art's role in? How has art played a role for you in addressing racism? Um, it has given me like a chance to leave my stamp on what's going on in the world. You know, so um, for instance, last summer, like we have, we have been in the house for months on end and um, then everything happened with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery. And it just, I felt so defeated, you know, but it was me going to this big protest downtown and hearing one of my friends, Martika, she put, um, she like put together this entire manifesto. Um, and she was speaking on the power of black artists and how um, this is our time to reclaim our space and to um, not sell ourselves short anymore and so hearing her say all of these different things it just spoke to me so much and from that moment moving forward I was literally determined to come for everything that I knew was mine that I deserved and not not um also like I was just thinking about past experiences that I've um dealt with uh with some of these art institutions here in Syracuse and how um, they either used or abused or manipulated me into doing all of this labor for little to no compensation. And um, that is like a, a, I was talking to some of my other artist friends and that is just something that for the longest we have all been just so accustomed to. And um, it just had me thinking about like, what is a way that I can um, not have to rely on these structures? And so um, after again, having these conversations with my friend Martika and a few others, um, we actually, we uh, began this collective called the Black Artists Collective last summer and um, began putting on different events, again, to um, uplift and amplify the Black art artist voices here in the city. Um, and then I also began my art fund where I could also have this pocket of money so that I didn't have to rely. I didn't have to rely on um, being denied from grants that I knew that I was more than qualified for, um, because I've been doing the work for seven or eight years now. Um, everybody knows about me here in Syracuse. There, were, I just didn't understand why you know some of these opportunities were not coming to me, and so I got a chance to speak to somebody that um, was on the committee for one of these um these foundations and she was telling me that the the language that i was using in my proposal so my my i i honestly don't think <laughs> that i i don't know my natural like my authentic voice was unfamiliar to them and um it, it disqualified me from that alone disqualified me from uh that grant like what i so it wasn't about the actual work, the scope of work that I was trying to do. It was about the tone in which um, I delivered that message, you know? 
And that's a problem. You know, I think the, the bigger issue is we don't have people in these rooms that look like me that can decipher and know exactly what I'm talking about, you know? Um, so that was, that was definitely a learning experience. And from there, again, I'm just the type of person where once I put my mind to something, I'm about to just do it on my own. And that's exactly what I did. So um, I, I started this campaign on Instagram and, um, and Facebook. And I, I didn't know what to expect from starting this art fund, but I was able to raise um, $10,000 in 10 days. And so that helped me with um, come up with my new line of work. Um, and then also the creation of my, I'm working on like this new um, prototype for a, like a 3D printed Jalito doll, one of my dolls. So like, um, and then being in my studio space as well has given me like this new freedom to experiment and explore my artistry in all different realms. So um, for me, I see art as being this remedy to all of the, the stressors and the, the craziness that exists in this world. For me, that is my escape. That is my, my, my moment to um, go and collect myself because um, I'm stressed most of the time. <laughs> so um, yes, it's really, really nice to, uh, again, not only be able to provide all of these different opportunities to um, other black artists here in the city, um, and, but also to just be respected enough to where people wanna support. You know, um, that was such a big moment for me because I don't like asking people for stuff, but unless it's a grant. Um, so yeah, it, that was just a big, big learning, um, learning experience for me. And um, I can't wait to see like what happens this summer. You know, I, I feel like um, everybody is ready to come out the house and we have some events and stuff we're planning for this summer. So I can't wait for everything to unfold. Well, I think, you know, when you were talking about your experience working with the local structures and the art community there and not getting paid and, you know, not having a, more than a seat at a table, but, you know, creating the table and uh, having ownership in it. Um, one of the things that I've learned a lot through uh, Farhana's work, even just through Twitter, Farhana, <laughs> is, and I've included this in my teaching, is the idea of decolonizing. This is a very new concept to me, and it may be a new concept to a lot of people. I suspect it is, like your average person almost guaranteed is like, what's that? Right, so unpacking that. And for me, at a core level, it's about making sure people are at, have authority. They have voice in the whole process from the beginning up. Is that pretty fair to say, Farhan? Is that seems like a pretty reasonable uh, synopsis? Is that, if you, if you come uh, yes, away with in, that? In some ways, yes. <laughs> okay, I'll take it, I'll take it. I'm learning, you know, which is the point, right? So I think this sheer awareness of these problems to me is the very first step. And being aware, um, you know, growing up in the 80s, I used to watch G.I. Joe a lot, the cartoon. And they used to have this awesome, it was uh, like a small public service announcement. It was knowing is half the battle was the phrase that was used in G.I. Joe. And I use that all the time. And being aware of these problems, like the difficulties that Jaleel's encounter and other people have encountered, um, and the concept of the need to be conscious, even by people who, who, certain, who may or may not understand uh, the consequences of their actions in suppressing other people and their voices, um, making them aware, uh, making myself aware uh, that I'm part of a system and I need to hold on a minute and really be mindful about my actions and its effect on other people and have them at the center of the conversation um, and giving people authority that they deserve and finding solutions for the problems. So, I mean, Jaleel, your work in addressing that uh, has been profound and I really appreciate that. And for Hannah, I really appreciate all the things that you've done, uh, even just over social media, uh, me picking up on that stuff has, has taught me a lot, and I've been able to bring that into my classroom. And this concept of, of uh, climate justice is something that's really starting to come to the forefront of conversation, including in the Biden administration and what they're trying to do, the whole of government uh, approach up against a massive machine 
uh, that's um, just unbelievably powerful. Uh, but in addressing that and trying to raise awareness of this, uh, there was a great quote that I came across by author Mary Robertson in Climate Justice. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Yet, when it comes to the effects of climate change, there has been nothing but chronic injustice and the coercion of human rights. And I think that really kind of starts to frame the conversation, the idea of climate justice. So, you know, your work in bringing to light this concept of climate justice, can you help explain what climate justice is and how it's related to social justice? Uh, sure, um, I'd be happy to. Uh, so let me first start uh, just a little bit with, um, you know, just talking about climate change and then linking that to climate justice and social justice. So as we've talked about, you know, um, throughout this webinar and as uh, others probably already know that, um, you know, the causes and impacts of climate change play out really unevenly. Uh, we've talked about that in terms of the inequities that play out, the disproportionate burdening. And we're seeing that these kinds of the unevenness and the frequency of events, but then also the uncertainty of these events um, are further marginalizing communities globally that have historically and geographically contributed the least, yes? So climate change is a threat multiplier. So it basically, the climate crisis um, plays out or manifests itself simultaneously in multiple facets of people's lives. And it, and it becomes this building phenomenon. It affects one thing, it affects another, and it becomes cumulative. So it's environmental, social, political, economic, and so on. And each of these have their own interconnections and complexities. But when we think about climate change, we can, again, in broad brush strokes, think about the ways that these issues are compounded and amplified and worsened because of, of climate change and climate breakdown. So climate justice, again, in broad terms, is about addressing those uh, very inequities, those inequitable impacts of climate breakdown. So climate justice is about systems change um, and addressing the structural inequities and power systems that uphold the systems that continue to cause harm via climate and also via other systems that are operating in conjunction with climate. So issues in um, climate justice uh, movements and scholarship in pedagogy is thinking about how to foreground concerns around equity, um, inclusivity, and um, justice, right? So to have these kinds of conversations that we're having right now. So when we think about climate justice, one way to do that is to think about the linked concerns, like about linking climate to concerns of social justice and racial justice and gender justice. These are various things that are linked and I know they may feel overwhelming to think about simultaneously, but we need to start thinking about them simultaneously rather than being isolated. So we can think about climate justice, um, you know, in terms of uh, domestic context and any country we want to work in, but then we need to look at the wider scale internationally across countries, because as I said earlier, there are historical and spatial connections, right, through colonialism, ongoing neocolonialism, and the capitalist global economic world order. So what we're seeing is that we need to think domestically, locally, domestically, regionally, internationally. Um, so for instance, um, you know, somebody in the questions posed uh, what happens to small island nation states. So the, you know, the many communities of color in the small island nation states, or they're often called SIDS, standing for small island nation states um, in the Pacific, but then also coastal countries, you know, in the tropical and subtropical zones that were once colonized by European powers, but then now subjected to various geopolitical, um, you know, structures of power have historically not contributed a lot, but are facing the kind of climate injustices of sea level rise, land loss, thereby facing loss of homeland. What do you do when you face loss of homeland, not just your economic job, your own well-being, your communal um, you know, security, uh, your community security, but entire loss of something you know as your country or your homeland. You know, these are issues that are also of concern to indigenous communities, you know, especially in settler colonial contexts, but indigenous communities worldwide that have faced these kinds of loss of homeland concerns. So the, to bring it back to climate justice, uh, climate justice therefore asks us to think about 
or rather questions the profit-driven motives um, of the global systems and envisions a future where equity-driven and non-exploitative outcomes are prioritized rather than profit and greed. Um, and so we need to think about, you know, what are the ways different vulnerable communities are further vulnerabilized and take that into account, but then also take into account not just humans, but non-human species, um, and then link that to local power hierarchies, imbalances, and then also the geopolitical power imbalances that continue to marginalize some over others. So this is, you know, kind of what climate justice uh, means globally. Um, and because climate change is a product of colonialism, consumerism, and capitalism, certain patterns have um, emerged uh, in terms of spatial differences. So what we're seeing is that there are increasing um, sacrifice zones that are created where people's cultures, ecosystems are persistently destroyed. Um, and what is called ecocide and genocide continue to occur globally. These sacrifice zones are basically spaces that are deemed disposable. They're not important because they're not, you know, they're important to sacrifice for capitalism or global growth or that, you know, the fetishization of growth rather than well-being. So if we think about just and equitable futures and to slow down climate breakdown um, and these planetary and humanitarian crises that keep emerging, we need to therefore really foreground climate justice. We need this to be better understood and more systematically interconnected to policy structures um, and then decision-making, whether it's fossil fuel extraction, hyper-consumptive lifestyles, imbalances, policy negotiations, um, neo-colonial institutional designs, and then political obstacles um, to move the needle forward. And what we're seeing is increasing demands for greater um, transparency, accountability, um, cooperation, um, and then collaboration, and then also reparations are increasingly entering into the foray in discussions around climate justice. And we're seeing this in countries um, that are often late to the table, such as the US. When it comes to climate, the US is quite late to the table um, in terms of at a governmental and, and a majoritarian way. Whereas in comparison to other countries, um, especially a lot of the small um, powerless countries across the global South, where discussions around climate injustice and climate justice have been much more longstanding because the lived realities of climate breakdown there have been longstanding. Um, but then this is also true for racially marginalized communities and indigenous con communities in industrially advanced countries of the global north, such as the US. So what I'm trying to say is that there are similar patterns that exist across differences. And those are the patterns that we need to connect and identify and link up with so that you are therefore able to mount a, a greater um, you know, interconnected set of discussions around uh, climate justice. So what I'll conclude with is just a commentary on the fact that we are witnessing this growing awareness around climate justice around the world, um, including in the US, where we're seeing more mobilization and action around it by folks who weren't talking about climate 10, 20 years ago. Um, different groups and organizations are taking more concerted efforts to work with policymakers, politicians, um, students, um, average citizens to address um, this growing, growing uh, climate breakdown. And, and the goal is largely to accelerate justice-oriented cooperation globally. Um, and it, this is entirely possible. Uh, we can change the trajectory we're on. There just has to be greater political will, uh, get greater people power, but then also decolonization of global power structures. <laughs> and what excites me um, about this is that there are actually numbers of ed um, educational opportunities for students um, to take courses to learn about climate justice, uh, such as the course on climate justice that I teach here at Syracuse University, but also for regular folks and decision makers to learn about the complexities and connections of climate justice because of the availability of things like this webinar, but then also educational and informational source resources online. And what this means is that there's a greater chance, a greater hope for climate justice oriented um, concerns to be brought up, to be addressed, to be taken more seriously in more meaningful and ethical ways and not just rhetorically and through lip service because that is unfortunately what is still going on. So we need to continue to have these conversations to move the needle forward. 
Thank you. Um, and I'm really appreciative of the work that you're doing out in the world, doing all these webinars and getting dry mouth syndrome and skipping meals and all the things that happen with uh, folks like yourself and uh, Michael Mann, who's done a, a fabulous job at uh, getting information out to uh, the public about what can be done and what's happening. Um, so thank you. Janice, you know, Farhana mentioned problems with structures and equity. You know, you've done some amazing work at Rhodes there in Makanda. So my question to you was, you know, has science education shifted over the years to become more equitable? And do you have any examples? Um, sure, thanks, thanks, Ken, and thanks for inviting me. I've got a little bit of a sore throat, so please forgive me. Um, I hope it doesn't mean something else and that it's just a sore throat. <laughs> um, so, you know, so my research, um, I'm a professor of biotechnology and roads in Makanda. Um, um, so I'm here in the journalism school and X is, is next door and, and we've got some other team members here as well. Um, so thanks journalism for having me here. So as a lowly scientist, <laughs> um, I've learned a lot in this process. And I really like what Farhana was talking about. Um, it really resonated with some of the challenges that I faced as a scientist. And that is that coming into this space, um, there was a system that we inherited. And I didn't quite ever sit and reflect on how much that impacted on the way in which I did science. So I was quite comfortable coming here as a student um, accepting, you know, the both the patriarchal notions of excellence um, that, that you know was pervasive, and then of course, you know, racially as well. So I I never really saw myself as a coloured woman from South Africa going into those spaces as a as a professor. But what really helped is, is having people before me, those coming before me, black professors before me, and I had to think about in what ways was I perpetuating, you know, the continuation of certain narratives. And interestingly enough, it was actually in my research itself. So my research has always been very firmly embedded in the community, community needs, um, you know, things that we can do must impact positively on society. Um, so we do research in early disease diagnostics so that people in remote communities can have access to healthcare, the same healthcare that you can get in a, you know, in the West potentially. And of course, I work in water and developing technologies for treating water, you know, being a water scarce area. But what we were missing out on repeatedly was actually engaging communities. So when our students came and started off their PhD research or their masters or their, their honors, they would consult the literature, the scientific literature and you know, we'd have some idea or some perception, at least, of what um, what the needs were in communities. And so we do this research. But what we didn't do was actually speak with impacted communities. And in many ways, that is makes absolutely no sense. And it's also fairly disrespectful, um, considering where we are headed with this. And so I... Um, I was awarded this research chair um, by the Department of Science and Innovation to explore ways in which we embed science engagement or engaging communities directly into the postgraduate research. So this means that our science students not only consult the literature, they consult communities. So if research is going to be impacting on a certain, certain community, um, we get the necessary ethics clearance, et cetera, and students can then begin engaging in having real discussions and so asking, what are the concerns? What are the needs? And in many instances, what this has done is shifted the actual research. So we had a, a perception or an idea of how something might play out. Um, but having spoken with communities, that research has then, then shifted. So our students have been impacting, I think, in, in many areas. And this whole idea of engaging communities um, is being done at various stages. It has to be practical, obviously. So for some students, it's at the inception of their research. And that is, it's quite challenging, obviously, to do that because you need the research funding, you know, um, to be in place to go out, you know, to go into the laboratory. Um, and for some students, it's, it's at product development. 
Um, and there's a great story with one of my students who developed a nanofiber-based water technology unit. And he had an idea of how this is supposed to be a simple device that could clip on and then just allow you know, water to trickle through and then be purified in a low cost system. And he had a specific idea of how this would, what this would look like and how it could be used. And then after engaging communities and you know, as, as X said, in, in, in the Kanda, if you talk water, if you want to have a discussion about water, everybody will talk about water. So there was no issue in getting the community to engage around this and to grapple with this. And um, that helped to shape what the product will ultimately look like. So the idea is that we are getting localized perspectives to help inform our research. So that really changes how we do um, we do everything. And I, I feel that there are multiple wins, not only in developing technology that communities actually need and want and will use, but it certainly impacts um, on the whole space. So um, the research then becomes responsive. It's respectful of the community's voices. So it's not this deficit model whereby we have the knowledge and now we are sharing that with you, which is, you know, um, again, an inherited model. It's engaging, it's valuing communities, perspectives and, and voices. Um, there's the second, I think the second big win is for our students, because when I interviewed them after going into communities or engaging with communities, they indicated that it shifted them fundamentally. So they were not doing research. They realized um, who they were and how society saw them. They never really considered what role they could play as scientists in changing um, and in bringing about positive change. Many of them said that they felt more kind of like um, motivated to do research that was going to bring about um, a change. So, Engaging communities, traditionally science students do not do that. Pharmacy students do that, med medical students do that. But the way science has been taught and is really sort of at a distance from the community. And so in this way, we're giving our students the opportunity to get out of the lab, engage. And I feel that this is opening up so many avenues for themselves as, as um, not just as scientists, but as, as people as well. And I think that there are definitely positive benefits um, all around. So one of the questions that we have um, uh, that got brought up by Jason McGill is, uh, what are some of the things that we can do as ind on an individual level to foster change and create better environment for the future as humans here on this planet? We thought, Farhana, you mentioned like, and this is always the thing, right? I mean, you have these big corporations and governments and these huge systems that we were born into. And, you know, if we're lucky enough to live in somewhat of a democracy, uh, we have some say in some of that with our dollars and so on, where we spend our money or where we don't, you know, what are the things individuals can do? Mm -hmm. I, you know, Janice, you brought up the people coming up through the sciences mm -hmm. and going back to their communities and, and providing answers and working with people. Well, actually, I, I suppose if in answering that, I, cannot, I, I don't have, I'm going to be answering another question here, mm. but um, our students, interestingly enough, um, uh, our student body has changed and, and X will know that over the years. Um, I was looking at some statistics uh, a few weeks ago, and we are now, certainly at our undergraduate level, very representative of the demographics of so the South African society, and that's really excellent. Increasingly, a lot of the students coming into biotechnology, which is an applied field of science, come from um, communities um, in the Eastern Cape. So our students um, speak um, speak Corsa. They are, um, you know, they are, they're comfortable with the culture, um, and they also have a lot of personal. So a lot of the issues that they're trying to resolve, the research they're trying to do, is very personal for them. So we have some students, for example, come from the Trans Sky, who have um, one student has no access to water, um, no electricity, and he's doing his, his master's at Rhodes. Um, so now while I'm not advocating everybody to go off and do a degree, I'm interested in the fact that this has become so personal for our students and that they are now better, uh, better enabled to, to bring about change through um, through the scientific process, but just turning this on its head, because the students have 
So my perception of science now has shifted in the way we do scientific research. I feel that it has to start within from the community where we can establish what the issues are. And so uh, these students are already halfway there. They understand the issues, the culture, um, they speak the language, and they have issues to address. I think science can be taught the way in which we, you know, we, we do hypothesis driven research that can be taught. But I feel that in this new approach, our students are um, better empowered to make to make that difference. But we also need to shift our mindsets in terms of how science is, is conducted. So I think certainly globally, there is a, a big move, um, the EU's responsible research and innovation movement to try and get people to try and get scientists to engage. But I think that these kinds of processes have been happening. It's just been given a, you know, a name now. I mean, I think certainly um, being conscious of your own water usage, um, using your voice to speak with um, political leaders, keeping up that pressure. I think that the big changes have to happen when governments come on board and realize that this is the will of the people. That's excellent, excellent advice. And for me, it's uh, not always staying in your lane. Uh, Jamie, you got some uh, <laughs> not being afraid, you know, to start the conversation. Uh, Jamie, you got something to add? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think I think a lot of times in the climate communications world, you know, you, you see things as individual actions, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you take individual actions, it's sort of the recycling thing. Okay, we'll recycle our stuff, or we'll 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 drive less, or this and that. Um, you know, not to put a huge wet blanket on that because those actions are important. Um, but they're, they're, they're not sufficient and they're not anywhere close to sufficient to deal with the scope and scale of the issue that we have. Um, what, so, you know, and, and if anybody tells you there's one silver bullet to this problem, you know, they're, they're lying to you. Um, the, the, I guess where I've, where I've been really encouraged is, you know, seeing people, you know, in all walks of life, you know, including people in businesses, including people in, in, in governments, you know, the, the, those are people like that. The, yeah, there are big institutions there are these, these structures, but there are actual real people behind those, those institutions. And where I've been really encouraged is, is where people within those institutions that wouldn't talk to me 10 years ago, um, call me on a regular basis, right? And, and they, they, they do earnestly want to make change. Um, so, so I, th I think the, you know, what can we do about it? Um, I mean, to me, it's, it really is about dedication, you know, um, like in whatever field you choose, whether it's the arts or the sciences or, or math or, or, you know, whatever it is, you can bring that to the table, right? Um, I, I, I have chosen design, you know, even though I have a background in natural resources. I mean, I, I consider myself an artist. I consider myself a designer. Um, and I wanted to marry those worlds together and just dedicate myself to it. And, and, and just not about the money, not about career, not about any ambition, just being like really super dedicated to it, not worrying about everything, anything else, but just like, if I get really good at this thing, that's the contribution I think I can make. Right. And, and, and being really dedicated to that. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any prescriptive thing that any one person can do. I think it really is about, about dedicating yourself to, you know, if you are dedicated to the climate, you are dedicated to the environment, you are dedicated to, to equity and justice, dedicate yourselves to it, you know, pick a path um, and stay, try to stay on it you know, as best you possibly can. But, um, you know, that, that, would, that would be my advice. That's excellent advice. And it's perfect. It leads us right into our last part of our discussion here. It's my favorite part. It's hope, you know, um, the name of Dr. King's speech wasn't, I have a complaint, <laughs> right? He had a dream and you have to manifest that hope by living the best life you can and learning as much as you can and walking forward bravely the best you can and uh, shoulder to shoulder with other folks in, in the way, humbly. And so, you know, to, to close this out, just take like one minute each. Jaleel, you're up on, you're, I see your face. How you doing? Hope. What, what brings you hope? What brings me hope? Um, hmm. uh, being able to be a, my 100% self and um, walking into these rooms, knowing that I'm worthy, you know, of being there and um, seeing younger kids looking up to me. That's something that gives me hope. 
And that's part mm -hmm. of the reason why I love doing what I, what I do. So um, I will say that. Beautiful. And I'm very thankful you're here with us today. Really appreciate you. Kalile, how are you? What offers you hope in Makanda, South Africa? What offers me hope is that um, the more I stay consistent in what I want to do, the better the things would be. And then to find solidarity, knowing mm. that in the future is bright. And I think moreover now during the pandemic, people are starting going back to being humans than just being focused at their career. People are starting to share because things were just focused in institutions. Now people are back to being humans and caring and loving. So I think that has given me hope that the whole concept of Ubuntu people are human beings before their titles that they happen to carry. So I think that for me is giving me hope that uh, there is change. Even myself, I believe in it. So obviously uh, in, at the Black Power Station, we're having these constant conversations saying that there is hope. The more we use our language to communicate with our people, it's easy for them to detect what actually our future is. And I think even with the water, Mm, shortages with the water, uh, people that from rituals that people cannot access because they cannot access water because land is private. People, so there is that hope that people know that this level of spirituality people need to be engaging. As an artist myself, we have given a chance to give hope to people. I guess for me, uh, that is been the moment that I've been using. Well, you offer me hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you all you, all you folks offer me hope uh, <laughs> in helping to unpack this very complicated world that uh, we have in front of us. Ernest, what offers you hope? Well, I mean, you know, once there is life, there is hope, right? Um, mm -hmm. There is no hope for the dead. And so I believe that, um, you know, the problem that we've created cannot be solved with the same mindset. And so, you know, what gives me hope is the fact that we can all come together as one people, regardless of, you know, color, regardless of one's background and to value every individual, right? Um, and the idea that we can all sit around the table and tackle the problems of the day. And I think we can, we can do that because we've shown that we can do it. And to me, the pandemic has really, you know, brought and has taught me who we are as humans. The fact that, you know, people can reach out to each other just to, you know, check on people tells me that we can do better, right? And so that gives me a sense of hope. Beautiful, thank you. Farhana, what gives you hope? Wow, okay. Well, um, as a kind of an interdisciplinary scholar, the first thing that gives me hope is that there are greater uh, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary collaborations um, moving uh, forward on uh, issues around climate injustices um, or global injustices, because we need these kinds of collaborations, right, to give us the kinds of um, answers and solutions and ideas so we can uh, move forward. But also what gives me hope is that folks around the world are collectivizing, using the knowledge that is being generated you know, by the social sciences, natural sciences, and so on. And they're doing solidarity activism to work on issues locally and internationally. Um, so various forms of activism have ar um, arisen, for instance, uh, the youth climate movement, um, but then also older folks who are getting involved with issues around water scarcity, um, you know, um, issues around uh, the global climate uh, policy making, um, and to elevate the voices of people who are unheeded, unheard. So I think one thing to remember is that hope is an action verb. So it is through the action and the doing that we have more vote, uh, more hope, because you cannot remain hopeless and helpless, uh, because communities who've been marginalized historically have never remained, um, you know, completely silent or um, not undertaken action. So the important thing you, ca you can do that, I, that gives me hope in the world is to learn more, 
to connect, to organize, to collaborate, to support others. Because remember, all of us have relational privileges. To, so use our relational pr privileges to raise the concerns about um, you mm -hmm. know uh, issues and then help elevate the voices of those who have historically been silenced. And mm -hmm. the fact that this is happening more around the world is what gives me hope. Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you so much. Again, what offers me hope is all the wonderful work that you all do. Jamie, when I saw your work with Habitat 7 uh, from my classroom uh, right before the pandemic, and we were working with the Mail and Guardian on some data visualization projects around climate change and mining. And I said, wow, this work is amazing. You know, it informed me, it moved me. And the fact that you know, you're taking all the lessons learned and moving forward, uh, I think is just exceptional. And I'm just really thankful uh, that you've been able to join us here today. Uh, Kululay, I love you, man. It's, it's been such a treat working with you. And I really look forward to continuing uh, to work with you in the Black Power Station. Uh, Jaleel, yeah. you are, you are um, an amazing human producing amazing work, helping to make sense of this mess that we find ourselves in this beautiful mess. <laughs> so I'm thankful for you too. Janice, thank you because you've given me insight into science and education in a way I've never thought about it before. And it's given me hope of thinking, as you said, you know, formally, a scientist was always a white man in a white robe and that's changing. And that's, that's profound hope, you know, and it just introduced me to new ways of thinking. Ernest, Thank you so much for being a part of this and offering us hope as well and all the work that you're doing and trying to understand sustainability and making sense of how in the world are we going to get through this and feed everybody and educate people. The work you're doing is so, so important. And uh, to Zalani, who was out there uh, resting, I uh, wanted to thank her for her beautiful song, and also for laying down some abundant wisdom for all of us. So in parting, uh, I wanted to invite folks, uh, some of our panels aren't able to join, but I'm, we're having an after event discussion. So inside the chat in about 10 minutes, about nine minutes from now, uh, we're gonna get together with the JOSA Youth Hub and the journalism school and just have an open discussion. So not a webinar format, but we can see each other, have you know, a 30, 40 minute, 50 minute discussion, uh, free discussion and to see how it goes to connect uh, with one another after this, after this wonderful talk. So thank you again, much appreciation to all the panelists, Rhodes University and Journalism School, and Newhouse and Syracuse and everybody that helped supported it. Thank you everybody. I hope to see you over uh, at uh, the after event discussion again, that link is inside the chat. Thanks, everybody. Take Bye care. Again.